Hello, everybody. Welcome to another installment of Club Moffat Talks. I'm your host, Chris. And I'm Ryan. And we're joined today by Jacob Torres from the, let me see if, let me just make sure I got this place right, the the location, the Tutoring and Academic Support Programs here on campus, here in the library, actually. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> awesome. And Jacob's here uh, to talk a little bit about himself, a little bit about some of the things that uh, he's researching and working on. So why don't you just take uh, take it away? Yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me on today. Um, I think this is a great opportunity, not only for the institution, but also for you know colleagues and students that um, want to know a little bit more about the lives and I guess academic journey behind um, some of the staff and faculty that work here. Um, but starting out, um, I guess I'll go back to kind of where my academic journey started. Um, I didn't know, I'm originally from Toledo, Ohio, and I didn't know that I was, I would be where I am today. Um, I grew up in a, a very working class family. Um, I didn't go to the best schools, uh, public education. Um, and when I got to my senior year of high school, I was debating on whether I was either going to go work in a factory like many people do um, from um, my background and from my side of town, or if I was going to go to college. I, I set up kind of a, a track for both options. Um, I didn't perform as well as I wanted to in high school, but um, <clears throat> that led me to actually applying to four different schools and I only got accepted into one. Um, and that was the University of Toledo, which was a which is an institution in my hometown. So I decided to go there. And while I was there, I fought around with the idea of, is this where I'm supposed to be? Um, do I know what I'm doing? And is this money worth it? And I actually ended up graduating with a degree in interdisciplinary studies, which was um, basically a, a degree made up of multiple degrees because I did not know what I wanted to do. Uh, which led me into um, getting opportunity to go to grad school. I worked for the university. I was involved with many student organizations and my boss actually uh, <clears throat> told me that I can go to graduate school for free, paid for. And, you know, I didn't know what that was, uh, but I went along with it. And when I went to my master's program, I actually got my master's degree in sociology and I studied a lot of diversity and inclusion. But with that came assessment. So I looked at a lot of assessment, demographic work, um, things along those lines that led me to where I am today. Um, and that took me to my starting my PhD in 2017. I made this drastic move and I just decided to move down to Mississippi State. Um, I didn't know anyone, but I really wanted to um, get a change. I wanted to get out of my hometown, out of where I, the area of town where I lived. And I started my PhD at Mississippi State in 2017, and um, I finished all of my coursework there, and I am currently in my dissertation phase. Um, so I'm writing during uh, this coronavirus past, I guess it's almost a year now. Yeah. Um, so it's been a little crazy, um, but since I am writing solely, I was able to um, work full time, um, and it and that's how I ended up here at Midwestern State University. I've got a quick question for you. It's just it's something I'm curious about. Um, your undergraduate degree in interdisciplinary studies, is that an actual degree plan or is it just something they give to people who can't decide quick enough? It's an actual <laughs> degree plan. And okay. it's funny because I noticed as soon as I came here to the state of Texas, then I think it's just uh, policy. Um, whenever you mention an elective <laughs> to a student, uh, <clears throat> It's it's almost like a well I can't afford that or I can't do that. Whereas I, I, at the University of Toledo, um, I kind of felt in this area between uh, communications, sociology, and anthropology, and I I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. And it was actually the first couple of years of this program, and it was like you have to just take um, I think it was like twenty twenty and twenty from each of those majors. And of course, with the core curriculum, and then you could get your inter interdisciplinary degree. Uh, since then, they actually become more and more popular because we always talk about in academia that research is very much interdisciplinary now. Um, and 
yeah, so it, it was a degree program. I kind of stumbled upon me. I didn't seek it out. I will be clear about that. <laughs> but that's kind of <laughs> the, the gist of it. I, I bring that up because I always feel like our university needs to be more interdisciplinary. Uh, my my undergraduate degree was a very interdisciplinary type school where you were required to take so many um, classes outside of your college to actually graduate. And I'd like to see more of that happen here at MSU. I know that one of the complaints I hear from both students and faculty members is it's very um, siloed. Uh, it's, it's very um, separated as far as as far as the various colleges. They don't talk to each other. The students usually don't mingle with each other. Um, so I'd like to see a change in that at this university. Um, yes, and we'll I, see. I, I think that's the kind of the projection going forward. When I got my master's degree, I was in sociology and I, I was specifically studying um, diversity and inclusion work. And as I mentioned, assessment, demographics, um, demography was a big thing of mine that I wanted to do. But in my program, I had a small cohort, but it was probably about 15 to 20. And although we were sociology, I had someone that kind of did, uh, from what I remember, research on the decisions that people make when they join terrorist organizations, which is very much uh, criminology, very much psychology, but it's also sociology. And it's, it's just a wide variety of things. I noticed in sociology, you could be an anthropologist, a sociologist, a psychologist, a criminologist, and essentially research the same thing. Um, and I noticed that even in my PhD now, I'm, I'm in higher education administration, but I'm studying Latinx students and Hispanic serving institutions and other um, researchers come from completely different fields. And it, just how funny how they all connect in in many different ways. Yeah, no, I'm I'm getting my uh, my master of library science. I hope I'm getting it. I'm in the middle of trying, but um, it's at the moment it's just this is the master of library science degree, and all of my advisors are saying like let's let's wait until you've taken a few of your your core classes before you decide which of the like ten or twenty or however many. Uh, side branches of this you actually want to uh to uh, focus in on uh and just yeah it's something like that i don't know it's there's a lot to think about with with electives and, yes 100 percent. it can yeah. be sometimes you have to make a decision <laughs> yeah <laughs> which which is bad for someone like me who's extremely indecisive i understand why they feel the need to specialize so much but tell you the truth I, I don't think it really follows what's happening in the job market. In the job market, you need so many different vast skills, which are probably unique to whatever job you get, that I don't know if it's really worth it to specialize a lot of times. I think I think more interdisciplinary type skills and more interdisciplinary um, type classes and degree plans at all levels from PhD below, I think is a good idea. And I mentioned again, I went to, um, they probably changed now, but when I was going, to, I was at the university, of uh, University of Texas at Dallas back when they did not have any freshman classes. And back then, um, the PhD program they had for the humanities was actually called the History of Ideas. It was a combination of literature, history, and fine arts, actually. So I, I, I always thought that was kind of cool, kind of interesting. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> so uh, what are you up to these days, Jacob? Anything that's caught your attention? You reading anything or watching any TV shows? Yes. Um... There's a lot. I, I feel like this past year I have just divulged in oh, <laughs> series yeah. after series, and I'm doing a lot more reading and listening to podcasts than, or I'm sorry, watching television and listening to podcasts than I am reading, which was the complete opposite a few years ago. Um, but one thing that, of course, um, is in line with um, my research on on Hispanic serving institutions is a book that I it came about. I think two years ago, but it's by a researcher. Um, her name is Gina Garcia, and it's called Becoming Hispanic Serving Institutions, Opportunities for Colleges and Universities. And it it is kind of the first um, grading system, I will say, for schools that are becoming Hispanic serving institutions. Um, so this is a Hispanic serving institution has been around for a while. But one thing that is unique about it is that it is now I think it's over way over 500 institutions now, but when it began, it was only about 20 and out. And it had a slow growth until about the year 2000. And then after the year 2000, many of these institutions were naturally becoming 
um, or organically is what I call it, um, becoming his Hispanic serving institutions, meaning that they have 25% of their uh, student population that is um, uh, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, and that opens the door to a whole bunch of of funding, right? Um, so many of these institutions are becoming organically Hispanics um, serving, whether they know it or not. And that's kind of where my um, research lies. But it, it, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. But um, the book is actually, since it is evolving and it's fluid, um, it there is a lot that you kind of have to take what you know from even a year ago and then update it to today's. So books like these I find are very interesting and important to have that reflection point from 2017, 2018, 2019 to where we are today. <laughs> oh, sure. And that stuff, yeah, it changes rapidly. And it's it seems like around the turn of the century, it just became this, this almost monumental thing, almost integrated into uh, campuses and universities. We actually have this online. I, I just went to check. We don't have it physically here in the library, but it's... Uh, you said it was becoming Hispanic serving institutions, opportunities for colleges and universities? Yes. We have an e-copy of that from EBSCOhost. So if anyone's interested in checking that out, I mean, we could always interlibrary loan it. But uh, we do have that online if, if anyone listening is uh, is interested. It does, it does sound like a, a really fascinating topic. Yes, and, and one thing about that is actually Midwestern State University although isn't officially a Hispanic serving institution, has the population to be one. Um, of course, there's a process, um, but it it is, Midwestern State has organically grown um, their Latinx population in along the lines of like Wichita Falls as well. So as Wichita Falls was expanding, usually you see that, um, that expansion at the uh, college level a few years after it's happening in um, the region. Um, and that's just, you know, more access availability. Um, but that's, it's very interesting, particularly for Wichita Falls and Midwestern State. Um, are there institutions? Now I know there have been historically, um, historically black colleges. Has there been anything like that for the, for Latinos, uh, a historically Latino type college, even from the private um, sector? Oh, um, yeah, so, so essentially, um, they're similar but different, um, of course, whereas Hispanic serving institutions came later than um, many of the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities. Um, but <clears throat> a lot of uh, these schools, the Hispanic serving institution schools are, you know, in the areas that are specifically <laughs> high in Mm -hmm. um, Latinx population. So we're talking California, Texas, and Florida are the big ones. Southern, um, Southern Texas. Yeah. 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 Along with, um, you know, New York and Illinois, there's some in the Midwest that have a uh, decent population, <clears throat> but it's almost getting to the point where it can't sustain itself. So there's one of two things that are going to have to happen or there's schools are going to have to either, you know, compete, whether they get that um, federal designation when, and particularly when it comes to, you know, the funding, because that's what that's the most important thing. Right. Um, but also um, whether the, the government decides to, you know, instead of the 25 percent and the 25 percent only indicates enrollment. So you are enrolling 25 percent. But are you retaining those students yeah. and are you graduating those students? Those are two. Um, and that's kind of where this area of research is headed looking at the retention rates, the persistent rates, and also the graduation rates. So you could be HSI, but you might have very low, you know, gra uh, Latinx, Hispanic graduation rate. So what are you actually doing then other than maybe recruiting those students and having them come to your school, but they're not graduating, what's going on? So that's where the research kind of is today and where it's heading, in my opinion. Yeah, you can't just say that you, you've got this population, you have to show that you're actually serving them. That there's something that they have that that you're offering more than just like, hey, come here, like, hey, come here, and we actually can show you that there are advantages to to attending our school. Yes, 100 percent. And this and then the institution's going to support you along the way, because the most important thing, of course, you know, is graduating. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I think, yeah, that sounds like a really an amazing thing. I'm, I'm surprised I haven't heard more about it, all things considered. 
It was, um, and this isn't updated information, but I, it was a few years ago. I believe it was in the strategic plan for Midwestern State University. Uh, however, I am unclear if it is in the most recent one, <laughs> uh, but sure. it, I, I know it was a, a goal or a target for um, the institution. I, I don't know what COVID did to that either, <laughs> or sure. the, you know, the, conjun the conjunction with uh, Texas Tech. I don't know how that looks moving forward. I, I haven't heard anything about that either, and it would be nice because we're we're currently uh, one of our first guests was uh, was the regional director for the government documents depository or repository that we're a part of, and it would be nice to just be able to uh, to have a better correspondence there. But yeah, we I have a feeling that COVID really knocked that uh, maybe a few steps backward. I would like to believe not, but everything's upside down now. One hundred percent. The pandemic are gonna get you. Um, yeah, this is this is something that's going to have to be edited out because, as, as I mentioned before, I get the kinda... long pause where we don't know what to say. I don't know. I think it's funny. <laughs> I think I might leave it in. Um, like it, put a sound effect in there. <laughs> put a sound effect. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about what you're currently working on? As in my research or as in my role here at Midwestern State? Whichever one you think that would people be more interested in, or whatever you think was more interesting to you. Um, yeah, I guess we could. I think me getting this role. Um, was an interesting, you know, journey. So I will be completely transparent. If you would have asked me maybe a year and a half ago, if I've heard of Midwestern State University, um, I don't know if I would say yes. Um, oh, because, believe, us, believe me, that makes sense. I think that's true for most people. I in fact, most people are like, Wichita Falls? Isn't that yeah. in Kansas? But yeah. <laughs> I, See, I've heard the of geography in me knew Wichita Falls. Mm -hmm. um, I just wasn't, I guess I wasn't, if, even if I did hear of Midwestern State University, I think I would have assumed maybe it was between two to 4,000 population, not as mid-size as it is, or as I experience it on a daily basis. Well, also, we're more of a commuter school, I think, in that that sense, just because uh, the on the on campus population is actually quite small um, to some extent. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, I finished my coursework at Mississippi State University in right before coronavirus, actually. Yes. Uh, so December of 2019 is when I was officially done with my coursework. And I knew I could um, finish my dissertation work wherever, uh, whether I was working full time or just fully um, working on my dissertation. That's when I decided to, I have a background in student affairs, which then went into um, that really diversity and inclusion at the institutional level. So I was helping create some policy. I was doing, I was at a state university. So therefore um, it was land grant. So we gave back to the state of Mississippi. So I actually would conduct all of the, the diversity and inclusion trainings for the whole state of Mississippi, their mayors and their um, city clerks. So I think there was three different separate trainings. There were like six hours each, and there was probably about 250 people at each. So I was doing that as part of the land grab mission of the university. And that actually allowed me to get a lot of connections and a lot of experience in um, being a practitioner of diversity and inclusion. And I began, I was like, I think I'm ready. I began applying and I won't mention the school in name, but there is a school <laughs> um, from this area that I actually had an, I accepted a job offer um, for. And what happened was as, as I was interviewing during my final interview and about a week after I received the official offer, that's when coronavirus in March. Um, so when everything was beginning to shut down and it was just a crazy time and I, that Offer was actually rescinded, believe it or not. Ouch. Ooh. And yeah, so it left me in a in a very weird place where I always had a job lined up. Um, <clears throat> and I had to look back and kind of dig into my working class background, which I'm a hands-on person. And I think I don't care what level I'll be at or wherever I end up, there's just something about, you know setting up for an event or moving furniture around. That is just nature to me. And I, I really think it's rooted in my <laughs> working class background. So from March until I began this role in August 1st of 2020, I 
was doing all type of things just to even make ends meet. Uh, there was I, I knew that there, there was a hiring freeze essentially at every institution. Um, so there wasn't I wasn't putting my effort towards applying to jobs, whereas I was kind of working and I did a whole bunch of things. I did DoorDash, I did Uber Eats, and um, it was just very humbling. And it, it, it reminded me of like where I started when I would, um, you know, worked at a fast food restaurant my first couple of years of college and I went bartending and then I was uh, a server at a restaurant to where I am now. Um, <clears throat> really was like a very humbling experience. So just so turned out that I was looking, cause I already moved, I, I live in Oklahoma, but I already moved to Oklahoma and I, this job randomly uh, essentially popped up <laughs> and I believe I applied, I had an interview and I think I accepted the job and I think started with all within like two and a half weeks. So it was like a meant to be situation. That's how I took it. And <clears throat> luckily, um, I was able to get, you know, a full time job during, in the middle of a coronavirus. There were yeah. some groups to jump, of course. But um, I was very grateful for for the opportunity. And, and I know I've been at like larger R1 <laughs> research institutions, but I was and I say this to everyone, I was truly blown away by the culture and the feel of Midwestern State University. It is nothing that I expected. And for that, it really ties into the it was meant to be situation. But that's kind of how I got into this role currently. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really weird. I mean, your your situation sounds I I'm going to I'm going to be honest, it, it actually sounds like you you had a, a much larger adventure than, than I did. But um, yeah, I was at a, a really low point, actually, and decided to look for uh, more library jobs. Uh, I, I didn't feel fulfilled where I was, and I actually considered just leaving libraries altogether. And it's almost as if this one position just kind of appeared, like out of the ether. Mm -hmm. And... And from from interview to actually moving halfway across Texas and settling in here, it was uh, an extremely quick turnaround. They actually had to push back my starting date here just because I had to set a lot of stuff aside to get here. So I totally understand and I, I agree. It's a very unique feel on this campus. Yes, um, 100%. I, I just remember that actually when I interviewed for the job, I was visiting home because I believe my sister planned something for her. She was supposed to have her wedding that week and I already booked my flight. So I ended up just going home anyways. Um, and on my way home, I got the call for the interview. Of course, I ended up interviewing in my parents' my <laughs> in my parents' <laughs> house, my oh, old sure. bedroom. And I remember like telling them in the interview, like, I'm sorry if you hear a train or people yelling, like I'm literally <laughs> at my home and I live in the city. So there's noises of all kinds that might come through. And then I got back. So I was only gone for a week. And then I remember I got back and I believe I started like two days later. So it wow. was it was just like the the craziest thing. Very similar. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's crazy. So what is your research into right now? You mentioned that earlier. Yes. Um one thing that I, I will, uh, the progress of my dissertation has definitely slowed. Um, mm. I was, ex <laughs> I was expecting to graduate December of 2021. And I guess just the vulnerability of higher education currently um, really made me take a step and look at what I have and where I'm at and kind of what Ryan mentioned earlier when it came to specialization. And I'm pretty well versed in many areas, particularly in student affairs, um, whether it's DNI, I have, re I have um, experience in that, I have experience in admissions, I have experience in student support services. So I'm pretty well versed there. But one thing I did notice is that I am not well versed outside of higher education. And part of me, kind of led on this personal development journey to where I need to realize that I need to be adaptable, whatever the situation, whether it's coronavirus, whether it's a recession, whatever it might be. Um, so I put a lot of time in, you know, generating passive, whether it's knowledge or even income, different type of like, I guess, adventures, you could call them. 
And just so that I know, because when that happened, when my situation happened before getting this role, it like when I mentioned it was humbling, it was very humbling because <laughs> uh, I had to, you know, I was in a phase of like working essentially to survive. Um, and that will, it just teaches you a lot. So I actually put my dissertation on hold, A, because I am, I'm still very, I'm very young. Um, and I, I feel like there's a, there's time, there's a time and a place. And my dissertation isn't going anywhere. My research isn't going anywhere. If anything, the longer I wait, um, the more data I will have. Um, so for me, that was really kind of the key piece. But one thing I, I, I am still diving in and expanding on, of course, is the demographic changes among institutions, both large and small, in the South. That is one thing I, I will, I mean, I'm ascribed, subscribed to a few newsletters and I always look at the most recent numbers and just see how they change from fall to spring, from year to year, um, whatever it may be. But demographics are constantly always flowing, which will end up being a huge part of my dissertation. <laughs> And again, I wouldn't worry about dropping off your uh, from your dissertation for a while. Um, I watched a docu, not a documentary. I watched something on YouTube this weekend, which was about Brian May's dissertation. The person was actually reviewing Brian May, the guitarist from Queens' dissertation. A lot of people don't know he was in the PhD program for astrophysics, and he began his dissertation in 1971, and then he joined this band. The band got big, so he stopped working on his dissertation. And then later, after he basically retired from doing music permanently, he took up his dissertation again 35 years later. Good Lord. Eventually published it. Um, and it was all still um, information that was new. No one had ever really worked on that subject before, so it was all still relevant. So, you know, if Brian May can publish his dissertation 35 years later, um, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily worry about putting it off to try to focus on other aspects of your life. <laughs> Yes, one hundred percent. I I don't know. I don't know if I can wait thirty five years. <laughs> but um, yes, I I like the the moral of that story. Make comforts me. Yeah, and it's like you said. There's a there's a time and a place, and you can you can have a pretty good idea of when that when the time is wrong. I mean, sometimes you might not know when when the time is right, but you can tell yourself like, ah, not not now, not now. I need to go back and evaluate things yes 100 percent. and it, even just recently i think it was last week or the week before when the um <clears throat> really the national fall enrollment numbers at institutions came out and, and there was a course as expected a huge drop not so much among upperclassmen but that incoming freshman class and it for me just being a quantitative person that indicates to me that okay what is what is to come you know um are, are these students not enrolling in college as a traditional freshman because they are in an economic situation or is it specifically related to, you know, COVID and, and living on campus and that whole experience? We don't, we still don't know exactly what the trends are. And I just don't want to put all my eggs in one basket <laughs> and then higher education, you know, just kind of continues this, continues a decrease and then I end up in the job market with, you know, more applicants than there are jobs. That's the situation I don't want to be. In. Oh, of course. You get into the old uh, adage back when I was uh, first looking for a job it was during economic uh, recession. And uh, the, the adage was, why is the uh, the grad, why is the master's degree student pumping gas? And the answer is because the PhD students are working in the register. I mean, that was the joke. Um, yeah, that's that's depressing. <laughs> I don't want to think about that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there is unfortunately. Um, well, it's interesting that you said that it's de it's declined because usually in times of economic downturns, uh, enrollment actually goes up usually because. Uh, people can't find a job, so they decide to go back to school to make hopefully make more money in the future. It's interesting that you're saying that that trend is kind of reversing this time, that COVID is kind of um, the opposite of what usually happens during economic downturns. Yes, and I think one of two things. First, that thing I mentioned about, you know, COVID and kind of the health aspects of COVID, whether that's a factor. But I think B is, is, a, is a larger conversation that was happening before COVID. And that was kind of the reinvestment into trade schools, which yeah. we see happening a lot. And, you know, even whether it's from the millennial generation who now is, you know, late 20s through 
I think even almost 40 now, they are now adults and parents with this huge amount of student loan debt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they are questioning. And now, you know, Gen Z is coming up with millennial parents and Gen X parents. And they are questioning whether it's worth the investment or not. Like, I see what my parents are going through, or I saw what my uncle went through, whatever it may be. Is that how I want to live? You know, Uh, is that how I want to live my life? Working a full-time job along with two part-time jobs. Is that and I'm going to say something that the, the higher ups in this school might not like me to say, but I think part of the problem is that universities have kind of made themselves saying, if you want to advance anywhere in any field, you need to go to college, which isn't necessarily true. I mean, we've, we've kind of adapted, uh, we've kind of forced the trade schools out in some ways. We've, we've, we've taken over this other field, this other uh, vehicle towards, um, towards employment and said, no, 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 you need a college degree to do anything. And I think that was a mistake because then you end up with with things like where they're really hammering the retention rates. Where they're saying you absolutely need re- because it becomes an investment as opposed to a way of training and learning, and it becomes a must-have uh, rather than something that can help you. And maybe you maybe you're not cut out for college. There's some people who may maybe aren't cut out for college. And by focusing so much on the investment aspect of it, you're saying, well, everyone must graduate. Everyone must must uh must get a college degree and there are some people that probably isn't the best way for them to advance to both themselves and their uh, economic uh, situation Ooh, yes. controversy controversy sure. there's a a lot i think there's a lot to unpack there that that you said in many of cases are true um it's really just that it all goes back to that question um what like what if and that's where I really feel for students who I don't want to say that maybe were privileged and didn't have to work through college or even work in high school. Uh, but one thing I was able to fall back on, which I'm so grateful for my upbringing, was that working class background. I have the hospitality industry um, experience. I also had you know fast food experience. And I just have this level of experience that is actually very hard to teach and something that you may not um, you may not get from going to a four-year institution or even a two-year institution. But uh, it was important for me to, you know, fall back onto that and use that training that I got at a younger age to help me survive. And it's interesting because back at Mississippi State, right before I I finished um, my coursework, I was working in the career center and I did um, career counseling and I taught a few career classes there as well. And the department that I had that would come up to me the most and say they had issues with their students not being able to, and actually companies would come up to me as well because we would often do career fairs and on-spot interviews, but they would always say the engineering students lacked the social skills and lacked the interview skills, but had everything else. Uh, I I have a friend who's an, an engineering or computer more, more like, uh, person he's working on his his dissertation as well and yeah you're you're correct about that and of course and of course it's not the entire population but this is the theme that would come from these companies and and even their those departments so mm-hmm. much so where they started requiring their students to take one of the sections that i taught there was like 12 sections but i taught two or three of them to help develop those skills and that was something that i feel coming up the background that i came up in was just natural to me. I had to, I had to develop those skills in order to, you know, essentially survive it is dramatic as it sounds, but, um, it, there was a really a survival mechanism was adapting to different situations. And it, it's just interesting how, you know, we undervalue those, those tools and those, um, <clears throat> lessons that you learn that will help you out in the future. So I, I really think that's important that, uh, pointing out now that I'm, you know, my late 20s reflecting on the way I grew up in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> well, that's really what the Learning Center is about, though, isn't it? I mean, a lot of the programs you guys do is about trying to get people, trying to fill in the gaps that the usual um, uh, college education here at MSU may have as far as um, just life or experience or just how to, how to deal with uh, f- people who might be uh, first time, uh, first person in their family to 
who ever gone to college. I mean, you guys really reach out to those type of first time experience type people to say, look, here are the things maybe no one ever ta taught you or no one ever told you that you need to know. 100%. And that's where it kind of molds back into that story that this position was like, <laughs> I was it made for me essentially because um, here, and I'll break down some terminology because it does get confusing. We are the learning center and within the learning center, of course, our office is tutoring academic support programs, but the learning center consists of the tutoring center um, and also the writing center, which is now part of the, a part of us now. And then we also have, um, we teach the first year seminar courses and we also teach skills for success, which is a, um, a course mainly for students that go on academic um, probation or, or, or coming back from suspension. And then we, in my role specifically, and this is only mine, it's a new thing that we're trying to develop is this academic success coaching, right? And it goes into what you, a lot of what you mentioned, Ryan, were these first generation college students. I was a first generation college student and it was essentially learning a new language. And it, it affects me so much that I, every time I hear an acronym, because, you know, higher education loves their acronym. Oh, God. I will break it down. So if, if you ever see a PowerPoint from me or any type of communication from me, if there's an acronym in it, I will break it down, unless it's repeated, of course. But that is because I remember a lot of people that at the university that I was going to were using these acronyms like I knew what they were talking about. And there's a way that you have to, for first generation college students, you have to translate that into something that makes sense, something that they understand. Like FAFSA, we we know what it is, but we really don't know what it is. Uh, we know it by FAFSA, but if you ask anybody what FAFSA stood for, many, 80% of them I probably couldn't tell you what the acronym stands for. Financial aid <laughs> for students. Uh, I don't even know if the, the F is for, but that's all I remember is financial aid. Um. We don't have to check it because I can't even tell you that I know it. <laughs> financial aid student Please. assistance? I'm sorry? Financial aid student assistance or something like that? Well, that, I forget. that would be silly, Ryan, because aid and assistance are synonyms. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I guess outside outside of that, it was just, the, it, it's one of the first ones we go to because we know it as fast fun and there's like a societal understanding of what it is, <laughs> but we may not know exactly what it is. But when we use TAS, tutoring academic support programs. You go by TAS because it's easier to say, but I make sure that every time I present or whatever it is, I'm telling you that it's tutoring academic support programs because that means a lot for a first generation college student. Um, <clears throat> there's just so many acronyms. You, It's almost like learning a new language. I remember having to repeat it to myself over and over if there was like a certain office that I needed to remember when I was in college that people might no, because they've been to the college before or their sibling went or whatever it may be. But part of my role is in this success coaching is focusing on those first generation college, um, <clears throat> you know, obstacles and hurdles, but also these very simplistic and overall simplistic. But, you know, I still toggle with them back and forth a lot. And I, many adults do. But. Things like time management, things of like scheduling, reading, your learning style, these things that we're expected to know, but we all weren't taught at the same or similar levels. And that is a really a big thing that we capture in these first year seminars. One thing that I think stands out the most is in our first year seminar is when we do the learning style. And <clears throat> I come from an assessment background, so I love these type of assessments. And when someone learns their learning, their, their learning style, whether that is visual, audio, or kinesthetic, and they know, then they learn the, we also teach about kind of the tools, skills used based on your learning style. It's like a light bulb goes up for them. They're like, especially when I see these kinesthetic learners and visual learners, and I'm like, yeah, you know, your YouTube videos that you watch, you can do that with college as well. Like if, if you are taking uh, astronomy, and you're not understanding the lecture, you go to class, you may not be retaining any information from the lecture or even from reading the textbook. Go watch that YouTube video. That will probably teach you, maybe not everything, but it's a supplement. That is a type of learning. That is a learning. TikTok is a good one, for, especially for Gen Z. Um, TikTok has a lot of content that is useful for students who need to get 
or understand a concept in 60 seconds. TikTok has so many resources. That is a resource and a supplement to your academic journey. Um, but those are just a couple of podcasts for audio uh, learners are a great example of a supplement. And these are things that we go through in these classes. And they, once you see the light bulb go off, it's it's just it makes it, you know, it makes it worth it. Just like something so that seems so simple could have just solved, you know, a problem that could have existed until, you know, late adulthood. And knowing that we do that in these classes is really what makes it worth it. No, I, I totally agree with you. And that's something that uh, I, I'm really glad that universities are specifically taking time to address to students, because the idea of sitting in your dorm or, uh, sorry, Ryan, this might annoy you, but specifically sitting in the library with a book open and just burying your head in, in the pages that doesn't work for everyone. And, and I'm, I, me, you know, I, speaking for myself, I cannot learn like that. I, I need some sort of visual aid. And I, I think that is a, a really important sort of learning exercise that, uh, yeah, it, it is a lot easier to do with, with advancements in technology. But I, I'm glad to see that becoming more widespread. Yes, and higher education, and this is what I tell my students, higher education exists in this format that was made for, I would say, audio learners and even partial visual learners. And that is you go to class, you listen to the lecture, you take notes, and you read your textbook, and then you are tested over that material. One thing that I think is going to be great about this whole COVID situation is that we had to expand the way we are teaching our students. And by doing so, we realized that some of these things work very well and some of them do not. And one of those things I think that are working very well are these interactive platforms. Um, <clears throat> so many of Gen Z, they came up with having cahoots in their K-12 education, um, Quizlet. Some millennials dabbled in Quizlet as well, like myself. Yeah. And those are just different. You can learn the content based on whatever type of learning style that you have. And those have really kind of surfaced during, during this past year. And I think many of these things will stick when it comes to engagement and interaction of between the instructor and the students. So one thing I'm grateful for is kind of that expansion of like the field of, in the way we teach to help the students become more successful. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. I'm actually kind of jealous <laughs> yeah. this stuff all happened like right after i mean i'm i'm uh, god i'm gonna be 32 in a month and um a lot of the way like a lot of this this new technology and the way it's used for learning it would have helped me out so much uh but yeah especially with i mean we saw we saw teachers and and all these these different professors and and any kind of uh, academic roles uh, just suddenly learn how to teach remotely and, and how to do these these kind of new ways of learning and what's the what's the what's the phrase um not art through adversity but but kind of the in that realm that um a struggle really really teaches us new ways of, of doing things and i i'm frankly shocked that that these things worked out as well as they did with just a month or two for, for people to learn how to do it. Some loved it. Some hated it. It's interesting <laughs> to see that some was, some never want to go back to teaching in the classroom. Some can't wait to run back to the classrooms again. It's kind of interesting to see the different reactions from different professors on this, on this matter. I'd really like to see if maybe in the future that becomes a, an elective way of being taught. Like if someone genuinely has a better retention and in, in learning and and just in general can can interact with their schoolwork at a, a much better rate i mean i know that's you know, for college a lot of that could be just just go take an online course but i wonder if especially for for um younger school kids or something if if that would be something that that might work better in the future it's interesting, a lot of magazines lately and a lot of articles and newspapers are talking about, is COVID going to be a dramatic break in our civilization, in our culture, and the fact that um, will things like online classes, telecommuting, 
uh, things of that nature, doing more and more online has been, uh, we've adapted to it. And a lot of people find out they like it much better. So will that be, will that go on after COVID? Obviously, some people are going stir crazy and they went out of the house and they can't wait to get back and be at parks or be at large groups and go to theaters and go to and go be in public. But people like my parents were like, you know, we've been retired for 16 years. Nothing's really changed with this whole COVID thing. Um, so it's interesting to see the different dynamics. And it's interesting to see, that, you know, I have a feeling things will not be the same when we get over there. there. There will be a much larger mix of online classes here on campus. There will be more people working from home probably uh, 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 here at MSU and other, other businesses across the United States. Mm -hmm. I think it is a major changing point as far as American culture in some, in some aspect. Yes, I 100% I agree. Um, and I also think that new generations, we're becoming less and less, um, I do a lot of assessments. So I do assessment like the VARC, which does the learning styles. Um, I've also been certified in Myers-Briggs and um, strong inventory assessment, which are just a whole bunch of assessments, honestly. Um, but I noticed that I, I, as I do them year after year after year, it's progressively, I'm getting less results, particularly in learning styles of audio learners. So it's, I, I would say my classes now, we did it this semester, 85% of my classes or students in my class are either audio or kinesthetic, which a majority of them being kinesthetic. And that's the hands-on approach. And that is because they, well, I believe that is because their K-12 education was more hands-on than any yeah. generation before. So that is their nature. Um, <clears throat> and and it, yeah, it's, you know, a lot of, I would say Gen X and even baby boomers, they're, they were forced to learn a specific way, which kind of naturally they adapted, you know, learning styles from audio and visual and maybe less kinesthetic unless they were specifically working class. And there's no, there's that gap's not, you know, it's not as black and white anymore. There's a lot of kinesthetic learners that grew up, you know, they went K-12 with these cahoots or the Quizlets that were very interactive. And now that's part of their life. So I think um, <clears throat> the whole COVID-19 thing and, you know, virtual, in-person, we're going to toggle with it a lot. Um, but I really truly believe that it will, benefit future generations to come i'd like to believe so i mean something something good has to come out of all this and and i'm i mean for me i i'm kind of at a, a crossroads with what ryan was saying uh, i'm both going stir crazy and i'm extremely happy that i don't have to leave the house as much same <laughs> but yeah i i don't know i kind of just want to go and watch a trashy movie in theaters or just go to the mall and and walk around uh, you, you don't realize you miss it until it's gone what's interesting is i do a workshop on classroom ethics and rather doing what a lot of places do where they do, do sort of a uh, do this don't do that type of thing which i thought was kind of ridiculous instead i framed it in terms of generational theory and i talked about these are the values a baby boomer type generation type person would have usually um, again, I said, you're, even if your professor's a baby boomer, he may or may not have these value systems, but on a, on, a, on a whole, on an average, this is what a baby boomer's value systems would be. And here's the value systems of a Gen Z or a, or, a, or a millennial. And you can see the difference in that. For example, one of the things about the baby boomers is they were very much a hands-on type people. They believe that you can't do anything unless you're there, unless you're present. So that's why, again, you're gonna, your baby boomers are gonna be taking attendance. They're the ones who get really upset if you're tardy and stuff like that. If you have a millennial professor, they're not going to care. You know, yeah, if you want to Skype in for the for the for the for the class, that's fine with them. If you want to um, watch a recording of the class later on and take your test later on, that's fine with them too. They're used to that. So it's interesting me trying to explain the terms of um, uh, what would make your professor mad based on generations because they are different. Those value systems are very different uh, as far as. Um, what your professor will allow and what they won't allow based again on how they grew up, how they how they experienced things, which was very different. And so they there is this idea that uh, that my way that I did it is uniform and it is the way that everyone should be doing because it it's the, the only way there is. And so hopefully one of the things this is awakening a lot of the professors to is there's more than one way to teach. There's more than one way to present information to for, for students to learn. And then some of them are going to have really good results from all this. And some will probably go back to the old way they're doing stuff, but that's how things are. I, I think also the mindset there is that uh, they perfected it with us, 
nothing ever went wrong with us. But um, having that mindset, though, I think is is wrongheaded. There, there's always room to improve. Chirp, 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 chirp. <laughs> Jacob, in your email that you sent us a little while ago, uh, you mentioned that you have to commute 77 miles a day. Uh-oh. Can you hear me? Yes. We can now, yeah. Yes. I don't, I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, anyway, I was talking. I was wondering what happened. But, um, yeah, so I commute 77 miles. <laughs> I know this. I, exactly. I get that. Uh, I, I understand the the pain there I, I had to do the same thing when i started working and by the way that's not unusual here on campus there's a lot of uh staff and faculty who commute from far far away uh to this university and you said we have a, a big commuter student base as well yeah i wonder if that's made things easier with with online learning just just being able to to not have to to have the stress of of driving every day on the other hand you're mostly doing country driving aren't you um jacob Yes. Yeah, it's mostly country. Okay. Because um, I know that I, I know people who had to commute from like you know, McKinney into downtown Dallas and stuff like that, and that was, you know, that's hel hellacious traffic and and it takes forever. At least, uh, hopefully, yours is kind of relaxing and stress free. Your commute. Yeah, it's it's just a it's a little long. Um, so it takes <laughs> about on a on average, I'll say it's about an hour and ten minutes, but. Ouch. anything can mess that up <laughs> um so sometimes i mean sometimes i can get here an hour depending on the turnpike um and other times it's an hour and a half like now it's about been about an hour and a half because there's part of i-44 <laughs> heading north in oklahoma that they have down you got to get off an exit and get back on it's like a little detour but it has a Ouch. large effect on the overall because i'm going you know the speed limit 75 <laughs> so to stop going 75 that adds on time you know <laughs> so yes coming here almost every day and commuting it's it's exhausting um yeah. but it, i'm it's what i it's what i have to do you know gotcha uh, <clears throat> and now i understand why you dropped your dissertation currently <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> yeah that, that can be very yeah, it's very tough. It's more just draining than anything because I love to drive. I've always been a driver, but I don't think I ever imagined myself driving. I do about a thousand miles a week normally. So, it, you know, of course, with that, that has a lot of repercussions. So it's like I get oil changes every three weeks. My yeah. tires rotated usually once every two months. So it just kind of stacks on and I have to deal with. Uh, I think since I started here, I've done like 40,000 miles since I started here in August on my on my car and um I had four tire blowouts today Ouch. and I'm waiting for another one. <laughs> Jeez. I just feel like they they constantly happening. So I invested in AAA which has been very yeah. useful. Um but it just comes with the territory I guess. Like I yeah. said you're not you're not alone. Um I've talked to people in communities who say well, I can't meet Friday afternoon because I'll be driving back to Fort Worth <laughs> or something like that. Or, you know, um, or again, when I first came to work here, one of the librarians uh, drove down from, I believe, Oklahoma City um, every day. Oh, so, yeah, that's that's up towards me. I'm not that. I'm about 15, 20 minutes north of Lawton. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of he was he was actually a little bit south of Oklahoma City. But yeah. OK. Yeah. yeah so I'm that. actually closer to Oklahoma City than I am Wichita Falls. Yeah. Um, but. It's, I, uh, yeah, coming from me being a city boy, <laughs> I'm originally <laughs> a larger city. Um, driving that distance is, I used to think five or six miles in the city driving was a lot. Yeah. Uh, but now, you know, here I am, I'm ready for whatever comes next. <laughs> yeah, welcome <laughs> to Texas. And yeah. The rolling green hills is, is uh, it's, it wears on you. It's very fatiguing. Yeah, well, they're not in rolling green hills. They're just flat uh, for the most part. Yeah, well, yeah, when yeah. I first came to Texas, we kept telling people, well, how much further is it to this place? And they'd say, oh, it's just down the road a bit, which meant <laughs> hour, two hour drive to get there. Yep. It's, it's, it's a different experience. Although it's weird because you go up to someplace like Connecticut and you tell them, oh, yeah, we're going to drive it to Boston. And they're like, oh, my God, you're just going to drive to Boston? Yeah, it's only, what, a two, three hour trip? That's no big deal. They just freak <laughs> out because it's like, oh, my God, that's you're not going to get a hotel. And, and you know, and, and like, no, it's just a two hour trip. Drive up there, do some stuff, then drive back. And they just freak out over that. So. You know, it's it's a matter of perspective. Yes, one hundred percent. So, what what podcast do you uh, fill the time in? You mentioned that you listen to some podcasts earlier, Oof. but now I'm now I'm really curious. Yes. <laughs> how I am big in the the podcast game. Um, 
I have like a routine. Um, <laughs> so a lot of them, of course, are just because of my personal interest are, you know, news focused. Those, those are usually my morning ones. Um, and then um, so Cheddar um, Need to Know is one I listen to a lot. Um, just to shout out a couple. <laughs> um, I also listen to, um, which is more of a culture, I would say, a culture podcast. It's called The Get Up. It's um, kind of very in line with the way I grew up, the way some of my um, my friends currently are, even my siblings, my community. So I really like that one. And then one of my um, more favorite ones is actually, um, it is um, Latinx Intelligentsia, which is a podcast that focuses on, on Latinx leaders in higher education. Oh. And so it's a specific targeted podcast for people that are in my field who are Latinx, and it, it is wonderful. So um, I get to learn a lot about other people working at different institutions. They also highlight a lot of things in Texas, which is very useful for my role now, um, that those are probably the main ones that I, I get into, but along with a few others. <laughs> Okay, and you know what, I think we're going to try to include a, a link to some of those whenever we get around to actually posting this podcast, just for just for people to see them and be able to spread them around. Perfect. <laughs> I'm impressed you're able to do um, actual um, podcasts based on your career choice. I think I would be bored as heck listening to a, a librarian <laughs> podcast all day long, honestly. Don't say that. <laughs> no, me. librarian podcasts are incredible. Ryan? <laughs> Yeah, I could see, I could see that. Yeah, that's why I have to switch it up. You know, I have to go back to, you know, some community, you know, cultural based thing that I grew up with. I, it will balance out my academic journey um, okay. and with the news, because a lot of it whenever I can only listen to these when people aren't in my car, of course, because yeah. no one else is interested in any of those. <laughs> Maybe the culture one, but the other ones now. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, I totally get that. Well, Ryan, you got anything to uh, you got anything to add? No, I think we've we're, we've <laughs> gone about an hour now. So yeah, this is this is the point where I start to wonder, like, did I miss asking about something? I know that there was something else I wanted to say. Well, and that that's, only, that only gives us an excuse to invite him back sometime in the future. That, <laughs> yeah, that's the point where I say, like, it's better for me to say that I've I've completely lost that than to to keep trying to to bring it back and keep it going so uh jacob was there anything that you wanted to talk about that we never got to because uh, i know we we were we were trying to get this going for <coughs> oh excuse me we were trying to get this going for a while <coughs> my throat's really dry it's okay i'll edit it in post ah, thank you we were trying to get this going for a while and <coughs> stuff just kept happening so yeah <coughs> Um, I, yeah, just, I guess one piece that I didn't really mention too much other than that I study Latinx students, um, was that I'm also in, I have always been involved, whether I was an advisor or whether I was a member of, you know, the Latinx student organizations here on campus. So I'm very like well-versed when it comes to student organizations, um, on the national level and then in particular, um, to each institution or each region. Um, and then also in the in the professional world. So I often get a lot of students that will email me from a few years back that that might be Latinx. And many of the school Midwestern state is has the highest population of Latinx students that I've worked at or attended. Um, so many of the schools were PWIs, um, uh, predominantly white institutions. And it's it's hard to find that mentor or that that professional piece, which is key, especially being a first generation college student and someone from a minority, you know, racial ethnic background. And I like I have the knowledge and I like sharing that knowledge with students, um, particularly that might be in one of these two areas, the professional or the student side. Um, there's a lot of resources and um, opportunities out there. The problem always is, is finding out where they are. Um, and that comes in the form of jargon, as we talked about within higher education, um, or even academic research, or even in the professional world, just translating these things to, to a level where it's understandable for any student. Um, but in particular, when it comes to my journey, um, as a first generation college student, um, who, nav or who 
who join different Latinx organizations and continue to do that and support them. Um, just letting that ev everyone that might be listening, uh, um, I am a resource here. There are many other young professionals here on Midwest and State that are also resources. And uh, I can almost guarantee if you get um, in contact with one of us, we'll connect you with the others. Um, and it's it's a great, uh, I've only been here for seven months now, and it's a great kind of community and connection that we're building and hoping to expand, um, you know, once, um, I guess, life, if ever, returns back to normal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's big if. But I think that is something that that we try to stress a lot is that we we really do want to help you out. Not not you in particular. We want to be... Um... <laughs> but we don't help you at all, Jacob. We don't like you. <laughs> Fair enough. But, <laughs> but yeah, we we do try to emphasize that that we're here to help, and uh, that's that's literally what we're here for. So yeah, we'll we'll include any links or or anything that you want in in the podcast description. I will just reiterate that we are here to help. I always think it's funny when people go when they 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 come up to me and they're very shy about asking for help, and I have to explain to them that's what they pay me money to do is to help you. So <laughs> yeah. Um, I, that is my job is to help you. So do not feel embarrassed to come and ask me for help. I'm supposed to help you. And I think one thing that we didn't mention is that we are located here in the Moffat Library. If you walk right through the doors past Starbucks, tutoring academic support programs will be on your right. And you will see my office is the second one with all the offices. <laughs> Wait a second. Is that Ryan's old office? Uh, yes, it is indeed my old office. Oh, my goodness. Uh, back before uh, before this building was renovated, yeah, there was there were the two offices, and then it was just open space. Yeah, and over there, we have the new offices at the end, and Clara and and my office work a little bit different. Like we don't have the automatic lights, our <laughs> heat and our cooling things are separate. I don't know. <laughs> well, again, that was the original offices that were over there. You're, mm -hmm. You are literally in my old office, so. Um, don't pull up the floorboards. That's where I hide the bodies. And if you sometimes <laughs> see him just in the corner of your eye, staring jealously, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. He has, he has a great vantage point from his office. Of the entire oh, I, I, that's the reason I picked this office. Yeah. I, could, I could actually, I can handle the reference desk now, and I can also handle anything over at circulation. I usually keep my ears open as far as any problems going on. That's oh, why man. I wanted this office. <laughs> and that's why they shoved me off in a corner here. So if, that's where you wanted your office is, is hidden in the back where nobody will bother. Yeah. If, if anyone, if they need me for anything, I'm over here slaving away. <laughs> well, if, if a window office opens, let me know. <laughs> I could use there this. used to be window offices in this building, but I think with the renovation, they, they, the idea was to provide all the window space they could for students. So I don't think there is a single windowed office in this building anymore. Darn. That's the one thing that I'm just I'm, I'm just so jealous of with the the library that I came from. All the offices were window offices, and they all overlooked a lake. Oh, well, one <laughs> of the problems also just to get just an aside before we close up. Uh, this building was been renovated several times. The area that both your office and my office are in was built during the 1980s, and the idea back then was that books were going to last forever. And so you didn't want to have windows because that brings in UV light, which can destroy books. Oh, you want to have thick walls that prevent um, rapid um, heating or cooling, which can also destroy books. It was all about protection of books. That's why this place, at least the section we're in, is built like a prison. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> and that's why our archival space was, um, every time we went to, to give someone a tour and we got to our, our big archive room, Ryan would have to say, by the way, these are all being damaged for for one reason or another, but we have to keep them out because we want to have them available. <laughs> I always thought that was that was amusing. It's true. But now now they're in a much they're in a much better place. Well, thank you, Jacob. Um, I guess we're gonna bring you back here sometime, uh, <laughs> probably in the future. Oh, we're gonna have some a bunch of other people lined up as well. But if anything comes up that you want to talk about or you want us to mention in your upcoming podcast, let us know. Um, I am horribly, horribly sorry that it took so long for us to get this actually set up. Uh, no worries. Things, things just happen all the time. I feel like that's going to be the story of my life. <laughs> it's gonna th a lot of stuff happened. Don't worry about it. But yeah, we're we're very glad to have you on, and we look forward to to working with you more in the future. 
Yeah, and I also appreciate the opportunity for having me on. I like stuff like this. I'm a people person. I don't interact as much coming from student affairs, so I love when I can. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. You want to come back on at any time, or if there's just something that you want us to mention whenever we record, yeah, just let us know. We're happy to have you on. All right, sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jacob. You have a good day. You as well. Bye. Bye. Okay, and that's probably where we're going to cut it. And he's actually leaving. All right. Um, <laughs> there we go. Um,